There's a pretty one, Ulysses. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am sitting in my reading and sleeping chair. Second time over ever only. I always feel a little bit weird about sitting in a chair like this for uh, making a video because I'm leaning back to support my back and I just feel, I don't know, too relaxed. I sit up. That isn't going to last and my back isn't going to hold out very long. So I'm going to lean back. Hopefully stay awake, because I have lots of exciting things to tell you about my reading, anyway. Oh, this is my other new blouse. And I shouldn't always be saying thanks, Mum. This was actually some money that I got just before Christmas from my dad that I used to get a couple blouses, and this is the last one to show you. So I love this one, too. In terms of my health, I'm getting better, but it's, it's gradual. I'm at least 50, probably 75% better than I was at this time last week. I think I've got a little bit more color in my cheeks and I'm not coughing nearly as much, but it's still quite a nagging, persistent cough, so we'll just keep going. Um, and do I have any other news? Uh, I haven't mentioned Kenji in a while, maybe, and that's not due to lack of interest. <laughs> We've been uh, keeping in good contact and, uh, you know, still not sure when he's going to get here, but uh, I'm thinking it's probably going to be spring or summer and I don't really have much else to say except that we miss each other and and as busy as I'm keeping myself with all this lovely booktube stuff, uh, I'm really looking forward to him getting here and us starting the Canadian chapter of our marriage. So hopefully by spring or summer at the latest, I'll keep you posted. It's been a busy week on my booktube channel, not so busy on my Patreon. If you didn't know, I have a Patreon channel. Check out all the details in the show notes. And here is the Week in Review. I remember Cardinal Pirelli in that novel that I just felt like he didn't walk. He he processed. every. He just seemed to be moving in a waft of incense uh, as he was going down the hall to the kitchen. Like he just proceeded. And I felt that something similar with Miss Inquire in this novel. And you thought that you've kind of picked that up too. Yes, uh, I mean, as we as we br briefly discussed, I think partly the way the narrative structure works as it sort of yeah. skips through the narrative and she sort of glides through the narrative in a way, like you say. Glide and, is a really nice word to describe it. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that she comes from outside of that world, so she is you know, moving through it almost... Uh, processionally as you processionally say. and and uh, i would like the campiness the queen the queen yeah. queeniness of the, yes. the there's a regal there's a regality there's a regalness to that processional kind of way of moving through the yeah. world I... but her husband wants her to be the traditional wife and stay at home so while she's surrounded by this totally different culture she is basically within a box and she stays within that box for quite some time, despite her efforts to, to push on it. Um, and it's interesting because in certain ways, her husband is actually very kind to her, very good to her. But it's a little harder for the Western reader to see that because all of the things she wants to do and asks to do, he puts down and doesn't allow. I hate synopsises, I, and especially the, the way they gloat. It's the most, it's a compelling tale of love and survival. Well, that, that's bullshit. Anyway, I'm not going to rant anymore about it, but Leah read, I think, a first edition hardcover of this from 1959, and she sent me a screenshot of something that was on the, uh, the inside flap about Elizabeth Jane Howard's writing. And let's just set the tone with this, because I, Sean the Book Maniac, approve of this message. At a time when it is fashionable to write like a bored waitress bashing down a cup of stewed tea on a greasy table. How nice to find a writer with such loving care for the language, such enterprise in using it. Well, here, here on both counts. Well, that's fabulous. I'd like to know who wrote that, but I have a feeling it might have been a gay man. <laughs> and here is book number two. The Alphabet. Margot Strout was saying, after even Charlie had settled into their chairs by bed four that Saturday afternoon. It's far from perfect, but we're making progress. The alphabet? 
Margot grinned, sucked audibly at a butterscotch candy, indulging her dramatic streak that Eve had noticed over the last week. Margot declined to explain anything more, leaving her demonstration to do the explaining. Hey, Oliver, do you know who just walked in here? Who I'm talking to? Margot resumed her work posture, pressing her index and middle fingers into the meat of Oliver's left thenar muscles. So yes, I've had a really great reading week. Dying to tell you all the details. I believe I have started three and finished four. Two of the books were for Buddy Reads. First one is my Buddy Read with Heidi of My Reading Life, and that is this memoir, Boys and Oil by Taylor Brorby. The subtitle is Growing Up Gay in a Fractured Land, and we have read the first section, which was about 110 pages, and it's his memoir of growing up in North Dakota in a small, violently homophobic town, and coming out, or come, at least coming out to himself in that unencouraging, shall we say, environment, which uh, reminded me a lot of my childhood, and also a lot of really beautiful nature writing. I believe this is his first published work, and Heidi and I have both noticed it's a tad overwritten. There's a few $64 verbs when a very regular $12.50 verb would have sufficed, but uh, for me at least, that's a very minor criticism, and I'm quite swept up in this, so uh, this is starting out great. Taylor Brorby, his name is, it may be an anglicization of a Norwegian name, but his ancestors came to America from Norway. And this is a buddy read with Sonia, of an enthusiastic reader. And that is the first post-Country Girls novel by Edna O'Brien. August is a Wicked Month, published in 1965. We have uh, read the first five chapters. Uh, the writing is lovely. We're enjoying it very much. And we were both a little nervous because it reminded us of some of the stories in one of her collected works of short fiction, which was called A Fanatic Heart. And there was a subset of those stories that we didn't enjoy as much as we loved all the others. And they were about protagonists that got into obsessive, um, darkly obsessive relationships with married men and kept getting her heart broken over and over again. I mean, it was a series of stories with different protagonists, all of which seemed like they were autobiographical. And those ones left us a little cold compared to the others. This is about a divorced mother whose father takes their young son for a holiday and so she's footloose and fancy free and she does get up to some mischief um, including at least one so far dalliance with a married man but so far we are not disappointed despite the theme um, it's not uh, I don't think I need to say this for people watching my channel this is not for any moral disapproval it's just that there was kind of an obsessive you know, lighting, burning candles at midnight and waiting by the phone quality to many of those stories that got a little bit repetitive after a while. Um, we'll see what happens with this one, but this the writing is just beautiful. And where it left off at the end of the first five chapters was that she decided to hop on a plane and go to the south of France. So we'll see what all happens there. But Edna O'Brien, as I keep saying, is the goddess. And... Uh, so much for my trying to whittle down my current reads to 10 books. <laughs> I found out this week that my dear friend Leah over on Litzy is involved in, I'm not sure if she's the manager of it or whatever, but she's certainly involved in it. I think she might be the head honcho. Knowing Leah, she's always got to be the boss of everything. I'm kidding, Leah. A furrowed middle brow book club. And they're reading like five or six books a, a, a year. And when I saw the list, I had one on my shelf. It's coming up maybe in July or something, so I'll, I'll, I'll try that one. But I also got FOMO about the one they're doing this month. Couldn't get my hands on a paper copy soon enough. And I searched all over, like Amazon.com and other places, probably .co.uk or whatever. They all had the ebook on Kindle, but not Amazon.ca. Like, Canada is so provincial. So, um, the novel, I should tell you, is called Clothes Pigs by Susan Scarlett. And Susan Scarlett is, is the pen name of a woman called Noelle Streetfield. I don't know if I know how to pronounce her name. Noel Streetfield. Streetfield, okay, well, this is from a website I've never seen before called the Right Pronunciation of Important Names. I have to bookmark that. No, no. Noel Streetfield. Noel Streetfield, okay. 
because the spelling is F-E-I-L-D. I'd never read anything by her under her pen name or otherwise, and I tracked down a $5 ebook on a website, I think it was called ebooks.com. You have a separate e-reader app and stuff. And I, uh, Streetfield died in, in 1986. She was mostly known as a children's writer, and so she wrote these adult kind of romances. Am I reading a romance? I think that a lot of the furrowed middle brow might be called romance novels. I'm expecting a very detailed, informative comment from Roz of Scallydandling because Streetfield was born in Sussex. Close Pegs is 1939. She wrote, looks like about a dozen books under that pen name, and they are gradually all being brought back into print by Dean Street Press, the furrowed middle brow imprint. And this one is, is starting out really sweet. It's about a kind of lower middle class family. Everybody's working. Maybe even uh, maybe even lower class family, but certainly money is a big issue, and the writing is just lovely. There's something about the prose, and I, I didn't uh, have time to kind of review the passages to figure out is it inversion that she uses a lot, but there's some kind of a wonderfully weird way that she structures a lot of her sentences that is quite, quite, uh, quite adorable. I'm enjoying it so far. It's very early days. I've read a couple chapters, so those are what I've started. I have finished four, and I have a lot to say, but one of them I've decided I'm definitely gonna re do a review. I put up a review last night, so you know that I'm not, I'm at least 50% of the time when I tell you there's a review coming, there's gonna be a review coming. And this, uh, let me start with this one. This is the Japanese novel I finished just this morning, and it is called The River Key by Sabako Ariyoshi, translated from the the Japanese by Mildred Tahera. In 1959 it was written, so it is maybe her sixth or seventh novel. So it's much earlier than the one that I read a couple years ago, The Twilight Years, 1972. I didn't end up enjoying this quite as much as I loved The Twilight Years and not quite as much by the end as I, as I was expecting to at the beginning. This was a four-star read for me. It has many things to recommend it. I still would compare it to Junichiro Tanizaki's The Makayoka Sisters, but it is not as powerful a work of literary fiction as that one was. It's also not as powerful as the later novel by Sawako Ariyoshi, The Twilight Years. It is still full of wonderful things. That's a really terrible way to put it. Uh, it still has much to recommend it. The historical detail was wonderful. I thought it was a little bit weak on character development, certainly compared to her later stuff. But it held my interest right to the end, and I'm glad I read it. Stay tuned for my review. And last night, I finished this work of nonfiction, which was just a wonderful book. It's called We Are Coming Home, and the subtitle is Repatriation and the Restoration of Blackfoot Cultural Confidence. Edited by Gerald T. Conaty or Conati. I started this for Skoden 2022, so I've been reading it since November. So glad that I got that I've kept reading right to the end. It was really, if I can put a book about museums into the category of being heartwarming, it really, really was. It's about the issue of repatriation of indigenous, of sacred indigenous artifacts, um, paraphernalia. Uh, in, in, in specifically in the context of the Blackfoot tribe, which in what is now Canada, most of the Blackfoot tribes were in British Columbia and Alberta, south of that colonial border. And there were three main groups of Blackfoot peoples. Their sacred objects, most of them were called in English bundles, that were used for annual fest spiritual festivals and other ceremonies and were ancient like they many of them were hundreds of years old and there was very specific beautiful sounding rituals for transferring them between one holder or keeper to another and many of them got bought by in the early colonial era got bought or stolen by collectors and we colonials impoverished to the to genocidal levels. We impoverished the indigenous population in the 
last, especially in the last quarter of the 19th century to the point where they didn't have anything to eat and we were withholding food from them so they'd sign our treaties. Yeah, Canada's a great place. We should be really proud of our history that uh, a lot of them were sold by the people just to get money to live. So they lost and, and, and then we put a ban on them doing any of their religious things and kidnapped their kids, put them in residential school for a deck for a century. So all that spirituality got, got lost and all those broken people, generations and generations of broken people. This book is about the fairly recent, I believe it started maybe in the late eighties, but certainly in the 1990s where the Blackfoot people got together and started approaching museums that especially in Canada, but all over the world, that housed those sacred objects, asking for them back. And it's about that process. And if that sounds dry, it's because I'm not explaining it very well, because there was something so deeply personal and, uh, like I say, heartwarming about the fact that colonists like me are educable. Museums, most of them were educable, and then legislation came in that expedited that process of getting these sacred bundles back into the indigenous communities that, from which they had been torn so violently. And then to see the rejuvenation of those, in this case, Blackfoot communities. Cultural confidence is in the title. And it to, to hear it in their own voices, because this is a collection of essays by museum people and by the indigenous spiritual leaders and political leaders who made all this happen. And it's still an ongoing process. This book was published in 2015. Still much work to be done. I learned a lot about the Blackfoot peoples and I had my eyes opened to this dimension of reconciliation because this is reconciliation in action. It was just a really affirming read. And to, to uh, again, hear these first person accounts of what it did for these decimated, colonially victimized peoples to get their really important spiritual stuff back and to begin to use them and to revive all these ceremonies that only their the, the uh, oldest 90 year old elders in their community still knew how to do and then to educate and then how that rejuvenated the various languages. Oh, it was just beautiful. It was beautiful. You should read it. I also finished this that was part of Bob the Booker's uh, In December <laughs> readathon, an Italian novel, If You Kept a Record of Sins by Andrea Bajani, translated from the Italian by Elizabeth Harris. Um, this didn't quite work for me, I have to say. I gave it four stars because it was certainly well written, held my interest, but it just wasn't a Sean book. It's about this young lad, Italian lad, I, don't, I think he might be in his 20s, when he gets word that his mother, who he hasn't seen or heard from in years, and the contact between them just tapered off um, to the point where it was maybe once a year, for several years. She went to Romania when he was a boy, I think he was 12. Uh, for work and she never came back. He gets word in his 20s that she's died and he goes to Romania. It's very mysterious because he doesn't know why she died. He doesn't really know much about her career there. She got into this career when she was still living with his dad in Italy. These egg-shaped human-sized things that fat people <laughs> would get into and it would help them lose weight or that was what they were marketed as. And that factory got moved to Romania in the post Ceausescu. Is that how you pronounce that dictator's name? Ceausescu. 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 Um, the Ceausescu's, the husband and wife dictators of Romania for a hundred years until when? The 1980s? After the fall of the Iron Curtain and um, the end of the Ceausescu's, that's when they relocated this factory to make these human-sized egg things that you stepped into for, for a treatment to help you lose weight. And so he goes to Romania for the funeral or whatever, but he's been so estranged from his mother, and he has so many memories of what she was like when he was young, and just the, the tapering off of the contact between them, the heartbreak that he grew up with and his father grew up with, because she basically 
started having an affair with her business partner, another Italian who went to Romania, and by the time he gets there and she's dead, her business partner, this slimy guy, um, they had separated and, she, and he was with a much younger woman. And that, I think, led to her kind of letting herself go, drinking her, I, nobody, and it's a big mystery. Why did she die? I guess she had a heart attack or whatever, but she, she, she was a very, very unhappy woman. And he's not all that curious. He doesn't really want to know, but he gets more of the story and he, the, the funeral's weird. And the little bit that people do tell him things, it just bits and pieces of weird information. And his character is kind of standoffish and he seems to be developing a crush on the, the young Romanian guy who's driving around. And that Romanian guy seems really sweet. Meanwhile, the young woman who replaced his mother in his her business partner's affections starts getting a crush on this kid. He's not a kid, he's in his 20s, and they fool around a bit. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of weird stuff. Powerful images, but that's about it. Like, the rest, the story didn't make sense. But if you were swept up by the images and read it kind of as a poem, I don't mean that it was poetic writing, but Edmund White has an afterword, and he was so blissed out on all these images. Well, yeah, the images were nice, but I was very unsatisfied. Despite the good writing, despite the interesting story, it was just too weird for me and not, there was no, other than feeling kind of a la Prince Harry, other than feeling kind of sad for this boy who is now a man that had all this, that was kind of abandoned by his mother, there wasn't much to latch onto emotionally. So it wasn't a Sean book. Lots of other readers out there have loved it. I only liked it. Four stars. The last book that I finished is one that I read to Kendra Winchester, and this also was from Skoden. It's Catherine Vermette's second novel, The Strangers. Oh my god, this book fucking ripped my heart out. It was so beautiful, it was so harrowing. It's just full of trauma, really deeply, generations of deeply victimized, deeply traumatized indigenous, in this case Métis women, in Winnipeg. I'll tell you about the four main characters. I'm not going to try to review this is a book. This is a book that I couldn't review, but it's one of the books that has destroyed me most deeply. Can I say it that way? Oh, it's so, it was so hard to read. There were moments of hope, but boy, they were few and far between. Just de lives of desolation and lives foreshortened by being a woman and being a Métis woman and growing up uh, surrounded by abuse and racism and all the addictions that that can germinate in that environment oh boy and it was so beautifully done it's a really tough book it's one of the toughest books i've ever read there's a grandmother the mother and two uh, daughters i will just tell you about them so the mother is margaret and margaret grew up in a fairly stable Métis home in Winnipeg. But her parents, their opportunities were circumscribed by the fact that they were Indigenous in Winnipeg at that time. And th so many of her brothers got involved in shady uh, in enterprises and s several of them were always in trouble with the police and some of them went to prison. And Margaret decided she was, she was really bright. She wanted to be a lawyer and that didn't work out again because of misogyny and how all of this oppression can can lead to violence and other self-sabotaging acts it's really hard to describe i don't want to give too much away so then she instead raises this her own family and is a really she's one of the bitterest women i've ever encountered in any fiction she's just so unhappy and she really wants you to know it as the reader but as her family she's just really harsh and then her daughter elsie and elsie is emotional and vulnerable and she's vulnerable to addiction and she and her mother have such a terrible relationship she keeps getting pregnant and ends up having i think four three kids or four three or four kids her life is almost blotted out by addiction. 
and so her kids are getting taken away from her and her mother margaret is raising them but then this happens and that happens and for katharina vermette to show in, in particular this character in the lowest of low moments and never to give up hope for her and never really to allow the reader as tough as being inside her mind and heart and body is for all these pages to to keep that flicker of hope alive wow what an incredible what a stunning literary achievement and then her two daughters the story opens with her oldest daughter phoenix in prison going into labor and so that's one of the other main characters and her life is all screwed up for very many reasons and then elsie's younger daughter cedar sage and cedar like her grandmother is bright and she has big dreams and she's the most hopeful character she'd been in foster homes and tragedies happened to uh, the family because of this foster home situation. She eventually lives with her father who she didn't know and works incredibly hard, is incredibly motivated to brighten her own future. And so flipping back and forth between these four women's experience, it was, well, let's just say it was intense and by the end, just incredibly rewarding. I love this book so much. It's not a book for everyone. You have to really be the kind of reader like if you're if you're gonna be so upset by all that terrible woundedness and the way that addictions can cause people to spin their wheels and act out and destroy their lives over and over again yet um, if you can get to the end it's such an important book it's incredibly heartrending I loved it even more than Katharina Vermette's debut novel, The Break. I thought I was going to be that much closer to getting down to 10 books. I don't know what the number is going to be by the end of what I'm about to tell you, but it's not going to be as close as I thought because I thought I was only going to start two, finishing four, so I thought that might have brought me down to 11 books, but then I remembered, oh no, I'm going to be reading a book aloud this week so that's three I'm going to be starting so I'll tell you first about the book I'm going to be starting and this is for one of my top tier patreon supporters and she has asked me to read her one of my favorite novellas of all time which I'm due to reread it this will be my third time reading it A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr so I finally purchased a physical copy of the book. The first two times I read it, it was on ebook, and it's this. I love this NYRB edition of it. So I've got it, and I'm going to read it to her, starting probably even later today. If you don't know J. L. Carr's novella *A Month in the Country*, you need to rectify that situation because it's one of the best books ever written. Really, I'm joining Angie's Fiction Addiction Book Club, at least for their first pick. The first book is a book that I've been dying to read especially since my my nemesis here on Booktube Scott, because we love the same kind of books but disagree on almost every book that we've both read. And this is one of the books that he loves. And the way he describes it, I think this is gonna be one that we're both gonna love. It's the January pick for the Fiction Addiction Book Club. I'll put a link to Ange's announcement video. It's Ange and Amy that are co-hosting this book club on Boxer, and their January pick is Mayflies by Andrew O'Hagan. I've been hearing about this book for years, and it's a very emotional book about a man who dies young, I think, I don't know how old he is, and about uh, friendship, uh, his friendship with another guy. That sounds like a Sean book, if, if ever there was one. And so I, find, I got a hard copy here, and I've borrowed the audiobook, which I think is read by the author, but it's certainly read in wonderful Scottish brogue, and I will be starting that in the coming week. I am so excited, and I hope to hell this breaks the curse that because Scott loved it, I'm not gonna love it. And this is a, well, as brand new of a release as I ever get to on my channel. This one just came out about a week ago. This is a gay novel from the UK, The New Life by Tom Crew. And I love that cover. This is the North American cover, and I love it so much more than the UK cover. And I have the audiobook to listen to along with 
reading it. This is a historical novel set in 1894, and it's based on the lives of, I think, it, John Addington Simons and Havelock Ellis. They're married, but they are homosexual, and they are immersed in the homosexual underground, the, the homo literati, the homo intelligentsia of London at the end of the 19th century. And it opens with a very homoerotic opening paragraph. So I have high hopes for this. That's what's going on. Thanks for watching.